Earth is located in the habitable zone of our solar system. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star, and all the planets have seamlessly orbited the sun since we were captured into its orbit billions and billions of years ago. On a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, it seems nothing has changed in our neighborhood in a very long time, or has it? For us to become conscious and then look out at the solar system from the Earth and begin to identify our location in the universe doesn't appear to be a coincidence. We are the remnants of stardust after all, just like every other object of matter in existence. And perhaps it is ingrained into our very being to recapture a godlike understanding of everything. Here on Earth in the past few hundred years, we have rediscovered the planets through telescope observation. But ancient Earth observers also knew about the planets of the solar system before the separation and further loss of understanding took hold. They tell us something different about our position in space. So different, in fact, to what we accept to be true that it is almost beyond comprehension. The petroglyphs, pictographs, geoglyphs, and the Rangu Rangu inscription document an intense aurora in the sky as visible from our planet. Incredible displays of plasma raining down onto the Earth that were documented in the form of petroglyphs cut into stone and the only thing that could survive what was going on this eventually assimilated into religion and worship all over the world, but what caused such an event? What happened in the solar system in prehistory that would upset the planetary cycles so drastically? Ancient Earthlings of prehistory eventually reformed civilization in the aftermath of this event, and when they did so, they began a worship of the gods in the sky, and these gods weren't physical beings. They were the planets. Ancient astronomer priest of Mesopotamia insists that the planets determine the fate of the world. In their prayers to the planets, they summon memories of a heaven shattered catastrophe, a catastrophe that was still in the minds of earthlings at the time of Plato when he insists 2,300 years ago that the movement of the planets had once changed. The ancients were absolutely obsessed with the planetary gods who they perceived as giants in the sky, fighting with one another, wielding weapons of thunder, fire, and plasma. Their wars not only disturbed the heavens, but threatened to destroy the earth. Ancient observers driven by fear all across the world, from Mesopotamia to the Americas, honored the planets in an almighty obsessive global cultural response that assimilated from the memory of the events of prehistory. The evidence overwhelmingly points to a lost fact of history, seemingly so obvious having followed the research of Anthony Peratt and David Talbot, that only a few thousand years ago, planets moved very close to the Earth, producing an intense electrical aurora event so intense that it destroyed the planet as we knew it in the epoch of the Golden Age. Ancient Earthlings observed these events from sheltered locations, documenting what they could, living how they could. In hope of change, they began to try to communicate through prayer, and we can now connect cultures at either ends of the planet as having spawned the same great myths, symbols, and ritual practices of antiquity. This was the effort to remember, to make sense of what is going on in a place that was out of reach. They had no control over the planets, and a costly misunderstanding of planetary history must now be corrected. Scientific researchers consider gravity to be the controlling force in the heavens. And from this assumption, we give credit to the doctrine of endless solar system stability and the belief that under the rule of gravity, the nine planets have moved on their present courses since the birth of the solar system. Based on the evidence garnered from the petroglyph record and the recreation of these symbols in laboratory conditions, we contend that humans once saw planets suspended as huge spheres in the heavens. Immersed in the charged particles of a dense plasma, celestial bodies radiated electrically and the plasma discharge produced sky-wide formations emanating from the magnetic south and forming the squatter man in many different phases over millennia. In the imagination of the ancient myth-makers, and in the words of Wallace Thornhill, 
The planets were alive. They were the gods, the ruling powers of the sky, awe-inspiring, often capricious, and at times wildly destructive. Cosmic lightning evolved violently from one discharge configuration to another, following patterns observed in high-energy plasma experiments and only recently revealed in the deep sea as well. Around the world, our ancestors remembered these discharge configurations in apocalyptic terms. They called them the thunderbolts of the gods. According to the Saturn myth authored by David Talbot, who asserts that Greek legends recall a remote and mysterious era of Kronos wielding a great stone sickle, the creator god of the harvest and member of the Titans whom ruled from the summit of Mount Olympus during the Golden Age before eventually being displaced by his own son against whom he warred violently. Kronos is preeminently the god king, his darker side concealed. The Greek poet Hesiod, first of the Western tradition writers in 710 BC says, First of all, the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos when he was reigning in heaven, and they lived like gods without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them. The fruitful earth unforced bare them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon the lands with many good things, rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. The peaceful epoch of the Golden Age is clearly the age of Kronos. If we move over to the more ancient traditions in ancient Egypt, we can assert that among the Egyptians, the father of the Golden Age possessed many names but each tradition proclaimed the same original excellence of creation and throughout their history, the Egyptians believed in a time of perfection at the beginning of the world and in the earliest age. According to the Egyptian sources, the great God was the first king, a ruler whose life served as a model for all succeeding ages. With the god king Osiris, the Egyptians constantly associated a vanished golden age. As King Osiris, the beneficent being, taught his subjects to worship the gods, gave them the arts of civilization, and formulated the laws of justice. Founding sacred temples and cities and disseminating wisdom from one land to another, he became the benefactor of the whole world. But his eventual murder brought worldwide destruction and, among classical writers, the idea prevailed that Osiris lived on our earth as a man who was also a god. Egyptian sources too often portray him in human form, yet the early religious texts say again and again that Osiris was the supreme light of heaven, ruling from the cosmic center, and he was in fact the lord of the gods, god number one. His body formed the circle of the celestial residence of the gods and the secondary gods themselves constituted the limbs of Osiris and eventually the traditions of Osiris melt into those of Ra, the god one who came into being in primeval time according to ancient Egyptian text. Just as Osiris followers remembered his rule on earth so did other Egyptians recall the terrestrial reign of the creator Ra in the lost echoes of history. To this age, the Egyptians continually looked back with regret and envy to declare the superiority of the one thing above all other things imaginable. It was enough to affirm its like had never been seen since the days of Ra. Ra, the father of gods, reigned over the terrestrial world, but wandered away when the heavens fell into disorder. Sir Ernest Wallace Budge writes that, All chronological tradition affirms that Ra had once ruled over Egypt, and it is a remarkable fact that every possessor of the throne of Egypt was proved by some means or another to have the blood of Ra flowing in his veins. However, the same belief can be applied to the god Horos, the god king, as well as Atom, Capria, Pitta, and Amon. And the fact which must be explained is that the memory of the creator king and his original age of abundance was far broader than any local tradition, to the point that the story was not limited to Egypt. 
Ancient tribes of Chaldea apparently owed their civilization to a powerful and benevolent figure named Oans, who ruled before a great flood swept the land away, according to Babylonian priests, who took note of their assimilation into Babylonian culture. Prior to the great figure, the tribes lived without order, like the beast. But the new god king who issued from the sea instructed mankind in writing and various arts, the formation of cities, and the foundation of temples. And he also taught them the use of laws, of bonds and divisions, also the harvesting of grains and fruits. And in short, all that pertains to the mollifying of life he delivered to men, and since the time nothing more has been invented by anybody. Sensationally, Oans is simply the Greek name for the Sumerian god Enki, worshipped in the city of Eridu at the mouth of the Euphrates. The tradition dates to the earliest stage of Sumerian history, a time when the myths say that Enki and his wife governed the lost paradise of Delmon, the pure place of man's genesis. Many ancient accounts attest that they alone reposed in Del Moon, where Enki and his wife reposed. That place was pure. That place was clean. In Del Moon, the raven croaked not. The kite shrieked not kite-like. The lion mangled not. The wolf ravaged not the lambs. Ruling over this favored dominion, Enki introduced civilization to mankind founded the first cities and temples, and set down the first laws. In the account of Barassus, the bringer of civilization appeared as a man emerging from the water. The earlier accounts call him the creator, and his home was the cosmic sea Apsu, the celestial waters of fire, rage, splendor, and terror. But Enki was only an aspect of the creator An, whose ideogram appears as the earliest Mesopotamian sign of divinity. In all the myths and temple hymns, the Sumerians distinguished the present age from that day, or the days of old, when the gods gave man abundance, the day when vegetation flourished. The supreme figure reigning over this remote age was An, the central and highest light, whose foremost characteristics was Lugal, meaning king, and the ancient Sumerian claimed that the very institution of kingship descended from the heavens of An, and it was An who produced the golden age, when the destiny was fixed for everything that was engendered, when An engendered the year of abundance. How widespread was this memory of a golden age, founded and governed by the creator himself? In Mexico, legends recount the ancient ruler of Quetzalcoatl, who appeared from the sea to become the good and wise ruler of the golden age. The legend describes the god as a lawgiver, teacher of the arts, and founder of purified religion. He was the ancestral founding king, and all later Toltec kings considered themselves his direct descendants of Quetzalcoatl. All the arts of the Toltecs, their knowledge, everything, came from Quetzalcoatl, and the Toltecs were wealthy. Their foodstuffs, their sustenance cost nothing. They needed nothing and got everything they needed in a very happy time of prosperity, of fruitfulness on the earth. The story of Quetzalcoatl finds the same confusion of man and God as in the legends of Egypt and Mesopotamia. And early chroniclers wrote that although this Quetzalcoatl had been a man, they respected him as a god. Indeed, he was the creator, for he made the heavens, the sun, the earth. Not only was Quetzalcoatl the giver of life, the legend proclaims that the first divine generations emanated directly from him, and eventually the gods suffered a violent fate, bringing to an end this global tradition of a golden age which is echoed all over the planetary culture of the earth from Denmark to China. The names are changed, but the overriding factors in each creation myth prevails to the same conclusions in Mexico, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. The Latin poet Ovid tells us that it was Saturn who ruled the Golden Age when he states that the first millennium was the age of gold. Then living creatures trusted one another. People did well without the thought of ill. Nothing forbidden in the book of laws. No fears, 
no prohibitions read in bronze or in the sculpted face of judge and master, no brass-lipped trumpets called, nor clanging swords, nor helmets marched the streets, country and town, had never heard of war and seasons traveled through the years of peace. The innocent earth learned neither spade nor plow. She gave her riches as fruit hangs from the tree. Grapes dropping from the vine, cherry, strawberry ripened in silver shadows of the mountain. And in the shades of Jove's miraculous tree, the falling acorn, spring tied the single season of the year. But then, old Saturn fell to death's dark country. There is not a race on earth that forgot this cataclysmic event the death of Saturn, the universal monarch, or the fall of Adam in the peoples the world over. For thousands of years awaited the full time of time's wheel when Saturn's kingdom would appear again to rescue the world from a decadent age of iron, which is widely thought to be the current age. The powerful memories of Saturn's age gave rise to a prophesized return, as announced in the famous lines of Virgil, where it is written that, now is come the last age of the Kumin prophecy, the great cycles of periods born anew. Now returns the maid, returns the reign of Saturn. Now from high heavens descends a new generation. And O holy goddess of childbirth, Lucina, do thou be gracious at the boy's birth in whom the iron race shall begin to seize and the golden to rise all over the world again. Richard Kilbansky and his co-authors write in their study of Saturn and melancholy that Saturn possesses the double property of being the forefather of all other planetary gods and of having his seat in the highest heaven. On the oldest and highest of the Sumerian and Babylonian gods whose primordial age was the year of abundance, which signified Saturn. And the same verdict is tacitly maintained by renowned researchers Alfred Jeremiah's and Stephen Langdon, who identified the great god Ninurta as both the planet Saturn and form of Anu. And one can add the well-known fact that the Sumerian Inki, Babylonian E, the Oans, and Barassus came to be the translated word of Cronus, Saturn, by the Greeks.